the lavender evening dress. A few years ago, the postmaster in a village that lies beside the lonely waters of the Ramapo River, dappled by light and leaf shadow in the morning and darkened by hill shadows in the afternoon, talked often about a lithe, tawny girl with hyacinth eyes and wheat yellow hair. He was a sophisticated gentleman, traveled and urbane, a member of a distinguished family in those parts. To atone for his sins, he said, he taught a boy's class in a Sunday school that was in session on the first day of each week after the preaching, in a tiny weathered church back in the Ramapo Hills. From the summits of those hills on a clear day washed by recent rain, the slim gray towers on Manhattan Island seemed to advance into sight and hang like figures long ago worked into the tapestry on the old blue sky wall. None of the boys in the Sunday school had ever entered the city on the horizon, and only a few of them had been to Hilburn or Slotesburg in York State or any of the New Jersey towns to the west. They were a shy lot, but wild as wood animals are wild, and they found the simple lessons in Christian ethics the postmaster was trying to teach difficult at best and impossible at those times when that girl was around. She went through his class, the postmaster said, like a slow pestilence. A boy would be gone for a month, sometimes two months, and then he would come back on a Sunday, glowering and sheepish, and one of his schoolmates would be absent for a while. The Sunday school teacher would sometimes see him and the girl picking wild blackberries on a hillside, or on a Saturday night, walking the road, shoes in hand, to a country dance. There was much talk about the girl among the hill folk gossips, and the postmaster, whose job gave him speaking acquaintance with most of these, gathered from what they said that she was gay and hot-tempered and amoral, feeling that the general admiration gave her the privilege of disobeying the somewhat eccentric conventions of her own community. The only time he had a good look at her was during a Wednesday night prayer meeting at which, according to an announcement the previous Sunday, the contents of three barrels of old clothes from the members of a New York City church would be distributed. The girl came in after the service, just as the preacher beat in the head of the first barrel. She was barefoot, and it was obvious that she wore only a stained and patched calico check dress, much too small for her. She sat in the back pew and paid no attention as the usual pathetic garments that are contained in such shipments were displayed and granted to those who could argue the greatest need. There was a gasp when the preacher pulled from the middle of the second barrel a lavender evening dress covered with sequins that glinted like tiny amethysts. It was cut low off the shoulders, and as soon as the preacher saw that, he rolled it up into a shapeless bundle and held it helplessly, waiting for someone to speak for it. No one did, but the girl stood up and padded swiftly down the aisle. Without saying a word, she grabbed the dress from the good man's hands and raced out of the church. From that time on, the postmaster said, no one ever saw the girl in other costume. Rain or shine, day or night, she was a brush stroke of lavender against the brown of dirt roads, the green of hill slopes, the khaki-colored shirts and pants of whatever boy strode beside her. Frost came early that year and leaves dropped. The air was clear and the New York towers came nearer and stayed longer. The hill people were all talking about a letter that had come to the girl from cousins in New Jersey. The postmaster had told one of his Sunday school boys that the letter had come, and the next day she had stood before his window and quietly asked for it, the sequins glinting purple in the shadowy room. People who dropped in the next day said her cousins had invited her to visit them, and they had sent her the money for her bus fare. 
A week later, a witness regaled the postmaster with a description of the expressions on the faces of the bus passengers down on the asphalt highway 12 miles away when the girl climbed aboard holding her long skirt about her waist. In mid-December came a cold snap, and the thermometer outside showed 18 degrees below zero when the postmaster opened his window for business. The people in the line of waiters for mail were more eager to give in the news than to receive their letters. The body of the girl in the lavender dress had been found frozen and stiff on the road a few miles above the bus stop. Returning from Jersey City, she had left the bus and begun the long walk home, but the evening dress had proved too flimsy wear for such a night. The postmaster said that after this tragedy, all the students in his class came regularly to Sunday school, and that was the end of the story of the girl. The girl froze to death about 1939, and for a decade nothing reflected doubt on the postmaster's conclusion. But now a growing number of people feel that his narrative, the truth of which is easily provable by many witnesses, has had an inexplicable consequence. Overtones that have transcended his matter-of-fact realism. For a strange report recently began its rounds of upstate towns and particularly colleges. It had many variants, as such tales do, but in none of them was it in any way connected with the account of the girl, her dress, and her death, a factual record known only in the vicinity of her Ramapo home. And the suggestion of such a connection is made here possibly for the first time. As I heard it, two Hamilton College juniors motoring to a dance at Tuxedo Park after sunset of a warm Indian summer Saturday on the road that runs through the valley of the little Ramapo River saw a girl waiting. She was wearing a party dress the color of the mist rising above the dark water of the stream and her hair was the color of ripe wheat. The boys stopped their car and asked the girl if they could take her in the direction she was going. She eagerly seated herself between them and asked if they were going to the square dance at Sterling Furnace. The thin, tanned face with high cheekbones, the yellow hair, the flashing smile, the quicksilver quality of her gestures enchanted the boys, and it was soon a matter of amused debate whether they would go along with her to Sterling Furnace or she would accompany them to the dance at Tuxedo. The majority won, and the boys were soon presenting their new friend to the young couple who were their hosts at the park. Call me Lavender, she said to them. It's my nickname because I always wear that color. After an evening in which the girl, quiet and smiling, made a most favorable impression by her dancing, drifting dreamily through the waltzes in a sparkling cloud of lavender sequins, stepping more adeptly than any of the other dancers through the complications of revived square dances, Money Musk, Culls, Victory, Nellie Gray, the boys took her out to their car for the ride home. She said that she was cold, and one of them doffed his tweed top coat and helped her into it. They were both shocked into clichés of courtesy when, after gaily directing the driver through dusty woodland roads, she finally bade him stop before a shack so dilapidated that it would have seemed deserted had it not been for a ragged lace curtain over the small window in the door. After promising to see them again soon, she waved goodnight, standing beside the road until they had turned around and rolled away. They were almost in tuxedo before the chill air made the coatless one realize that he had forgotten to reclaim his property, and they decided to return for it on their way back to college the next day. The afternoon was clear and sunny when, after considerable difficulty in finding the shack, the boys knocked on the door with the ragged lace curtain over the window. A decrepit, white-haired woman answered the door and peered at them out of piercing blue eyes when they asked for lavender. Old friends of hers, she asked. 
and the boys, fearing to get the girl into the bad graces of her family by telling the truth about their adventure of the day before, said yes, they were old friends. Then ye couldn't have heard she's dead, said the woman. Been in the graveyard down the road for near ten years. Horrified, the boys protested that this was not the girl they meant, that they were trying to find someone they had seen the previous evening. Nobody else of that name's ever lived around here, said the woman. Twarn't her real name anyway. Her pa named her Lily when she was born. Some folks used to call her Lavender on account of the pretty dress she wore all the time. She was buried in it. The boys once more turned about and started for the paved highway. A hundred yards down the road, the driver jammed on the brakes. There's the graveyard, he said, pointing to a few weathered stones standing in bright sunlight in an open field overgrown with weeds. And just for the heck of it, I'm going over there. They found the stone, a little one marked Lily, and on the curving mound in front of it neatly folded the tweed topcoat. Bond of Reunion Six good companions vowed one end of summer night that they would sometime come back to Pascagoula. They had parted in many another September, knowing that in June they would be together again beside Mississippi's Gulf waters. Now they were possessed by the youthful mood of perhaps never again, as their driftwood fire lighted the weathered pillars of the house behind them and the line of shore ahead where dark ripples winked on the white sand. The four girls had been childhood neighbors and close friends in New Orleans. Two of them would be graduating from college in the spring and there would be no more long, sun-drenched vacations at the rambling seaside house of Jane's mother. The two boys were brothers, Bud and Jimmy, and they had grown up in Pascagoula, helping the widowed mother with her pecan orchards and running wild in the moss-hung woods and along the Gulf Coast bayous. It won't take, said Jimmy, youngest of the party, unless each one of us leaves something he likes behind him. Then we can be sure there'll be a time when we can all be back to tell each other all that's happened to us since we went away. Oh, what do you like most of all, said Bud, laughing, knowing what his brother's answer would be. The sparrows, said Jimmy promptly, and all looked for the black outline of his catboat rocking at her mooring just offshore. It's funny, said Elizabeth thoughtfully, but I, I never think of the sparrow as belonging to anybody. She's more like one of us, the seventh one. We've sailed her over every inch of water in miles and miles. She's taken us swimming every summer day since we were infants. We all love her so much. Well, almost as much as Jimmy does. I reckon if we leave her here, said Jimmy, each one of us will be leaving the one thing in Pascagoula he loves most. And she'll make sure we'll be back, all of us, whenever the time comes. The five who still live say their vow was all but forgotten six years later. They were scattered as they had known they would be, and the idea of reunion had become impracticable and remote. Elizabeth had married a Yankee and lived in faraway New York. Of the rest of the girls, one was a social worker in Virginia, one was a housewife in Baton Rouge, and Jane, whose mother now lived the year round in Pascagoula, was teaching in a New Orleans grammar school. Then a letter brought each one of them an almost unbearable sorrow. Jimmy has been murdered, wrote Jane's mother. He took a load of pecans into New Orleans and had to leave the truck in town for repairs. On his way to the railroad station, he was hit over the head and robbed by someone who must have seen him receive payment for the load. He lay in the gutter, his skull crushed for an hour or so before he was picked up. He died unidentified in Charity Hospital the next day. The girls say they were so overcome with grief on reading the letter that the postscript made little impression on their minds. 
though they all remembered it later. The sparrow has gone. On the day Jimmy died, when no one was looking, she slipped her moorings and drifted away. Of course, Bud has had no time yet to look for her. I notified our friends the Coast Guard, and they tell me they have made a thorough search of all bayous, but have found no trace of her. The end of the story came three years later, and not so long ago. Elizabeth went to New Orleans to have the family doctor remove her tonsils. After the operation, the social worker came home on her vacation, and the Baton Rouge housewife could not resist the opportunity of being with her old friends. Though they had seen each other separately, it was the first time that all four girls had been together since the night on the beach when they had made their vow. On the first day of the weekend, they were motoring to Pascagoula. It won't be the same without Jimmy, said Elizabeth. I don't know whether I can stand it. You get used to his not being there, said Jane. Their automobile crossed the bridge over the Pascagoula River into the town at four o'clock. They knew this because they looked at their watches when Elizabeth exclaimed that the new roads had made the trip hours shorter than it used to be. They stopped at a drugstore for a few minutes to buy cigarettes, then drove the two miles out to the old beach house. Jane's mother stood in the doorway, and Elizabeth jumped from the car and ran to greet her. She stopped short when she saw that the older woman was pale and wild-eyed, shaking with emotion. The sparrow came home, she said. At four o'clock she drifted in. She's down there bumping the seawall now. As the eyes of the girls followed the direction of her pointing, they saw the top of the little mast bobbing up and down, and suddenly Bud was with them, an older Bud whose eyes seemed to burn with grief. He told us that the sparrow would see that we all came back, he said. And now, don't say it, said Jane sharply. And they were all silent in the shock of their inescapable surmise. Harp Notes in the Mist Years ago, I lived for a few months in the little town of Pass Christian at a tavern called the Inn by the Sea. On hot nights that summer, just as the sun seemed to be dropping into the waters to the west, my host would ask us to come aboard his red-sailed sloop, and we would skim the rippling surface of the Gulf of Mexico for a few hours before returning to our beds. Among those who sailed with us on those evenings were gentlemen who had been born in past Christian, and sometimes as the moon climbed the sky, they would tell us a legend of the old town. They said that when their great-grandfathers were young, the whole populace was awakened on a foggy night by a strange reddish glare far out on the gulf. Voices called through the streets, urging the young men to launch their boats and go to the rescue of a ship burning on the horizon. Out into the misty darkness, the boats sped, guided by the orange flames in the distance. As they neared their goal, the crews heard music drifting over the still black water. To their incredulous ears came the sound of harp notes and a melody that one of the elder rowers recognized as an ancient Portuguese love song. It seemed to come from the very heart of the flames. When the leading boat was so near that those in it could hear the crackle of the racing fire, there was a sudden explosion and the ship went down, leaving only a few charred timbers floating on the water. The would-be rescuers circled about but found no survivors. Shocked by the tragedy, they returned to the shore, and there, to their surprise, they came upon a beached lifeboat in which the captain of the ship and four of his men had made their escape. The captain was a handsome young man, genial and charming, and he made so favorable an impression on the hospitable folk of past Christian that they welcomed him to their homes, gave parties in his honor, and urged him to give up the sea and live among them. 
The captain told them that he was touched by their warm welcome, and before long he announced that he would accede to their entreaties. A month later he bought a plantation of many acres. The windows of its pillared big house looked out upon the gulf. Here he lived in luxury, attended by the four men who had been his companions. It was said that he had paid for his new property in golden Brazilian coins. All went well with the captain for more than a year. He bought a number of slaves and he gave such elaborate parties that he became the leading social figure of the aristocratic little town. Then a visitor from New Orleans arrived at one of the neighboring mansions and almost immediately died of yellow fever, which had been raging in his native city. Soon the dread disease was spreading over past Christian, and among its many victims was one of the captain's four accomplices. The doctor, who attended the unfortunate man, found him out of his mind with fever and heard him confess a horrible crime. In his delirium, the man said that a Brazilian gentleman had shipped aboard the captain's vessel at a South American port, bringing with him his beautiful wife and his entire fortune, which had been converted into gold coins and packed in a stout wooden chest. The Brazilian had told the charming captain of the gold, and the latter had no sooner heard of it than he determined to acquire it. He selected the four men of his crew whom he most trusted and informed them of his purpose. They would murder the rich passenger, he said, and load the money chest into the one small boat aboard. Then, after setting fire to the ship, they would row to shore with their loot and leave the rest of the crew and their victim's wife to die in the flames. They had carried out their scheme on the foggy night when the people of Pas Christian had seen the ship burning. The dying seaman said that as the captain and his accomplices rowed away from the blazing vessel, the wife of the murdered man, realizing her doom, had brought up from her cabin the harp with which she was accustomed to entertain her husband, and had played on it an old Portuguese ballad until the explosion had sent all on board to their deaths. After the death of his fever-stricken patient, the doctor realized that his report of words spoken in delirium could not be accepted as positive proof, but he told his friends what he had heard, and the captain suddenly found himself a marked man. He planned another elaborate party, and not one of his former friends accepted his invitation. Suspicious that his secret had been discovered, he decided to flee past Christian at once with his stolen gold. He rose from his bed at midnight, and taking his spade and a lantern with him, he ran down to the shore to unearth the chest which he had buried beneath a gnarled old oak. Unaware that he was being constantly watched, the murderer did not realize that the doctor and his friends had seen the glimmer of the lamp and had crept secretly to a nearby cove to watch his movements. Descendants of the watchers on that night say that their grandfathers have told them that as the captain uncovered the chest, an orange light appeared on the horizon and increased until the whole night seemed to be tinged with it. Then suddenly they heard the creak of oar locks and saw a ghastly crew of skeletons rowing in perfect rhythm towards the shore. In the stern sat a beautiful dark-eyed woman playing a strange and lovely melody on a golden harp. Apparently the captain saw this vision too, for he stood up quickly and then fell upon the ground. When the watchers reached him, the boat and its occupants had vanished, and the captain lay dead, his hands clutched convulsively about golden coins. This is why, so people who have lived long at Pas Christian say, on foggy summer nights those who look out to sea may sometimes behold a glare far out on the water and hear harp notes drifting through the mist. The Tale of the White Dove When the mistress of the big house lay dying, so the house slave said, she raised herself on her elbow and vowed that she would come back to her home. 
She would come back as a white dove to her husband and to the garden where they had been happy together. No white dove came to the garden for months nor for years. But on the day that the master carried a bride inside the pillared portal, the slaves heard a low grieving, and in the garden hardly distinguishable against the white blossoms on the snowball bush, they saw the white dove. Every afternoon after that, at exactly the same time, the bird appeared, uttering heart broken moans. The slaves were frightened. They said that their first mistress had kept her word. The whole community became excited. People began peering over the garden wall to see the dove. The bride became tearful, the master exasperated. Finally, one afternoon, gun in hand, the master strode from his house in a towering rage. As he approached the snowball bush, the dove rose in the air, fluttered toward him. He raised his rifle and fired. A woman's scream sounded over the garden, and the dove flew away, a sudden crimson staining the whiteness of its breast. That night, as he lay in his bed, the master died. No one has ever known the cause of his death. The master was buried near the snowball bush. And though the house has fallen into ruins and the garden is overgrown with weeds, the gravestone still stands. When I last visited in Alabama, neighbors told me that each spring, when the snowball bush blooms, they can hear a dove moaning in the night. Then they remember this story. One of them says that he rode by the old house one moonlight night and saw on the topmost branch of the bush a white dove. Its breast, he swears, was stained blood red. Magic Candle to Find Treasure Ingredients Human tallow, one piece of hazel wood, large. Preparation. Make a candle of the human tallow. Fashion the hazel wood into a horseshoe-shaped holder for the candle. Place the candle in the center of the hazel wood so that the candle is between the two parallel sides of the hazel wood. If this candle is lighted in a subterranean place and sparkles brightly with much noise, it is a sign of nearby treasure. It will sparkle more and more as you near the treasure, but will go out when you are quite close. Since the treasures are often protected by spirits of the dead, it is good to have some blessed wax candles along to provide light when the magic candle goes out and to conjure up these spirits to see if there's anything you can do to help them. It is most imperative that you do whatever the spirits may require of you. Hand of Glory. Ingredients. One hand of a felon, part of a funeral pall, zimat, nitre, salt, fern and vervain, optional, long peppers, fat of a gibbeted felon, virgin wax, sesame, pony. Preparation. Take the right or left hand of a felon who is hanging from a gibbet by the highway. Wrap it in a bit of funeral pall, and very tightly so. Put it into an earthenware vessel with zimat, nitre, salt, and long peppers, all very well powdered. Leave it thus for a fortnight and then take it out and expose it to full sunlight during the dog days until quite dry. If the sun be insufficient, try an oven heated with fern and vervain. Next, make a candle with the fat of the gibbeted felon, virgin wax, sesame, and pony. Use the hand of glory as holder for this candle. The use of the Hand of Glory thus created 
is to render those to whom it is displayed into a stupefied and motionless state in such a way that they can no more stir than if dead. Protection against the hand of glory. Ingredients. Gall of one black cat. Fat of a white hen. Blood of a screech owl. Preparation. Compound the above during the dog days. Rub the threshold or other parts of the house where entry may be made with this unguent and you will be safe. The Ghostly Hand of Spital House. George Alderson owned the English inn called Spital House some 200 years ago. It perched high on Stainmore in Yorkshire's North Riding. What with iron bars at the windows, walls a foot thick and steep stone steps leading to the oak door, chained and bolted inside, Spital House looked more like a fortress than an inn. One stormy night in October, the innkeeper and his son Bob sat cleaning their hunting knives and firearms before the blazing logs of the hearth. Up here on the moors, a man must be prepared for everything, remarked George Alderson, rubbing the shining blade of a knife on his sleeve. Aye, the master is right, declared the little maidservant Bella. Glancing from the pot she was stirring to Mistress Alderson, busy at her spinning wheel, "'Tis nights like this when winds howl and the rains beat "'that evil men crawl from their holes.' "'George and Bob nodded. "'They always kept their weapons handy, "'for in those days highwaymen roamed the solitary region "'around Stainmore as well as honest men. "'Both coming and going, travellers by stage "'twixt York and Carlisle, stopped off at the inn, for Spital House, though grim and forbidding outside, was cheerful and warm within, with a succulent joint usually turning on the spit of the hearth. Once a weary traveller had dried his boots and sipped a mug of steaming posset, Bella offered tasty soup from the pot, along with a radiant smile. A warm welcome and a good feather bed awaited folks at Spital House. Small wonder that fame of the old inn had spread the length and breadth of North England. Now, on that gale-whipped October night, George Alderson glanced around the comfortable room. The cheerful whir of the spinning wheel and the smell from Bella's pot made a man glad to sit by his hearth. We beat the storm by a good two hours, he remarked to his wife, Margaret, and lucky we are to be home from the fair. What with wind coming up and rain pelting down, it's good to sit here warm and snug with our horses bedded down for the night. That it is, Bob agreed and grinned at his father, and it's good, too, to have our handsome profits for the sale of our sheep bedded down in the cupboard tonight. Mistress Alderson lifted her calmly head and smiled at her men. And, Bob continued, since this is the sort of night cutthroats and robbers take for plundering the moors, I'm thankful to have my blunderbuss cleaned, <laughs> should there be need to use it. Bella vigorously stirred her pot. Bob was right. This was a night to be careful. She, a country girl, born and reared on Stainmore, knew more about cutthroats and robbers than her masters from York. She recalled many a story of stagecoaches robbed, horses stolen, and passengers murdered. As she thought of the dreadful dark deeds, Bella fancied she heard a faint knock at the door. Master, mistress, Bella cried, I think someone's at the door. Shall I open and see? Aye, lass, the innkeeper said, though it seems late for a traveller to be battling this gale. As Bella ran to the door, Margaret Alderson paused at her work. Best leave the chain on, child, she said in a low voice, until you see who's there. As Bella turned the great key in the lock and slid back the heavy bolt, a feeble voice whispered, Hurry, hurry, in heaven's name let me in, lest I die on your doorstep. At a nod from her mistress, Bella dropped the clanking chain from the slot and peered cautiously at their storm-whipped visitor. Before her drooped a gaunt figure leaning on a stick, 
The hood of the cloak the stranger clutched completely hid the features, save for two dark, piercing eyes. Let me in, the feeble voice implored. Tis a wicked night for an old woman to wander the moors. Poor soul, Bella thought compassionately, supporting the stumbling stranger to the settle beside the hearth. It was addled she was from wandering around in the storm. A sip of brandy and a rest by the fire would do her a world of good. And yet, in spite of her concern for the bedraggled creature, the girl thought the body next hers was remarkably firm and the voice deep for an old woman. Their guest sank to the settle with a pitiful moan while George Alderson added a log to the fire. But when Bob sprang forward to remove the black cloak, dripping puddles on the floor, the aged woman waved him away. No, no, rasped the hoarse voice, muffled within the folds of the hood. I want nothing but to sit here by the fire before I go on my way. Rest is all my old body needs. The poor soul was quite daft. Bella concluded. Only a witless person would forsake the chimney corner to wander abroad tonight. George Alderson, convinced that their guest wanted nothing but a nap in the warmth of the fire, drew Mistress Margaret aside. It's late, he whispered. We might as well get to bed. The old one's mad, if you ask me. I wager a gold sovereign she'll be right here come morning. As the Aldersons lighted their upstairs candles, Bella said, I'd best keep an eye on the poor one. I'll sleep down here tonight and lock up afterwards if she decides to leave. Swishing at the ashes with her broom, Bella stole a quick glance at the motionless hooded figure. The old one was sleeping, the girl decided. It wasn't until Bella reached down for the bellows that her heart almost stopped beating. The toes of a man's heavy riding boots showed from under the hem of the long cloak the stranger clutched, even in sleep. This was no half-witted crone, but surely a robber disguised as an old woman. Bella knew that she must not make a false move, not with the Aldersons upstairs and herself alone with this fellow. So she moved back and forth as usual, putting the room to rights. She set the milk to rise, then scoured the copper pot on the table. The figure on the settle moved restlessly. When do you go to bed, girl? The hoarse voice whispered. Right away, ma'am, Bella answered, untying her apron. Can I get you hot tea now that you've had your nap? Nay, nay, croaked the voice crossly. The hooded head turned away. Then if you want nothing, the girl said, I'll build up the fire and fix my bed. Nights like this, my room's cold, so I sleep on yonder bench where it's warm. The stranger grunted, but made no reply. Good night, ma'am, and rest well, Bella said sleepily from across the room. If, if you need aught, <laughs> call loudly, she added, for I'm a sound sleeper. <laughs> <laughs> that I am. Bella wrapped herself in her shawl and stretched out on the bench. Everything depended on her. Her own life and those of the Aldersons. In spite of the way she was trembling, she'd have to convince the outlaw that she was asleep. Yet watch what he did. At first Bella tossed this way and that. But in a few minutes she found that she could pretend to be asleep. All she had to do was count slowly, one, two, to breathe in, out, in, deeper and deeper, all the time. Bella narrowed her eyes to slits so she could observe the man on the settle. Possibly an hour passed before he stirred. Then, apparently satisfied Bella was asleep, he threw back his hood. By the flickering firelight, she saw a long, pale face with thin, cruel lips and eyes that glittered craftily. Without any warning, the ruffian suddenly strode across the room, then stood staring down at her face. If she betrayed herself now by so much as twitching an eyelid, he'd murder them all, forcing herself to repeat over and over in 
Bella found she could still pretend sleep. Only when convinced that the girl on the bench was asleep did the cutthroat return to the fire. There, from the folds of his cloak, Bella saw him draw forth an object so fearsome she had to stifle a scream in her throat. Her flesh crept with horror, for the awful shrunken thing the outlaw took from his garment and set on the table not far from the copper pot was old and withered, brown as earth from a newly dug grave. It was the severed hand of a man long dead. If the scoundrel had seen Bella's face at that moment, he'd have killed her at once. But fortunately, his back was toward her as he bent to light a candle by the fire. When he turned about, Bella managed to breathe more heavily than before. Glancing sharply at her face, the man thrust the candle into the half-open palm of the hand and began to chant what sounded like a magic spell. Lock those who sleep in slumber deep, and yet more deep, O oh, withered hand, show us the spoil, direct your light to treasure bright, help our waiting robber band, lead us to spoil this stormy night. When the words ceased, Bella took care not to slacken her breathing until she thought of a way to outwit the robber single-handed. She'd have to feign sleep. A blunder would cost all their lives. The crafty cutthroat began chanting again. Shine out, ghostly light, lead us, ghostly hand, reveal rich Treasure to our waiting band. The candle flickered brightly. It would point to the cupboard soon, Bella thought desperately, and show where the master had locked his money. Whatever she did, she must act quickly. But as the girl lay there, racking her brains for a way to warn the master, the man strode to the window. He pushed it open and gave a shrill whistle. So there were more cutthroats, and no telling how many, Bella thought in panic as she heard the faint answering whistles outside. She must thwart the ruffian before the others got in. An instant later, Bella saw her chance. After shutting the window, the robber went to the door and turned the great key in the lock. As he swung the door open, Bella leapt at his back and gave him a thrust that sent him bumpity bump down the steep stone steps that led to the door. Bella watched him collapse in a heap on the ground and lie still. Now the girl slammed the heavy door shut, turned the key in the iron lock, and slipped the huge bolts into the slots. Last of all, she secured the heavy chain. That will keep you and your friends outside, Bella muttered grimly. Wait till the master peppers your hides with his bullets. Master, come quickly, the girl shouted. But there was no answer. Perhaps they didn't hear me, Bella thought, and shouted again loudly as she could. Come at once, master. Bob, robbers are here. Robbers, I say. Can you hear me? She cried even more lustily. They're gathering outside. I, I hear their yells. But the louder Bella called, the more ominous was the silence overhead. And as to the horrible hand on the table, when she forced herself to take a quick glance at that, the candle was burning brightly, and now the flame pointed directly at the lock on the cupboard door. Master Alderson! Master Bob! Help! Help! Come! Come! Bella shouted, though by now she knew something dreadful had happened. Snatching a candle, she flew up the stairs, but when she held the light over the bed of the innkeeper and his wife, she found them sound asleep. The girl shook them and called out loudly. She even shouted into their ears, but she couldn't rouse the sleeping couple. Oh, dear heaven, what is the matter? Bella sobbed desperately, for by now the robbers were beating at the door. Bella ran to Bob's room, but the youth was sound asleep. It was only after she had doused his face with cold water, dragged him from bed by the feet, and still he slept. 
that she remembered the robber's spell. Lock those in sleep in slumber deep, and yet more deep. The ghostly hand and its evil magic, Bella exclaimed, anguish tears on her cheek. If I can't find a way to break the spell, we are lost. The robbers will kill us all. Without losing another moment, Bella darted for the stairs. She'd find a way, though she didn't know how, to extinguish the candle and shatter the magic that locked her people in sleep. But to her horror, Bella found the candle burning brighter than ever in the withered hand, and the massive outside door shivered and shook under the robber's battering kicks. Dear heaven, help us, Bella sobbed. Frantically, her eyes searched the room. She must find something to put out the flame. Outside, the robbers bellowed, Let us in, witless one, if you know what's good for you. Open the door before we sliver it to kindling wood. And as for you... The voices muttered, threatening and low, If you don't open at once, we'll slice you up as you slice a mutton joint. And then... We'll chop you to mincemeat, roared another voice one that Bella recognized as belonging to the ruffian she'd kicked outside. He'd come too. The girl shuddered as the voice continued. The others are sleeping a sleep from which they won't waken. They can't help you. Thump, bang, thud, crash! Bella blanched with terror as the furious blows made the copper pot on the table jump. The copper pot! Perhaps she could extinguish the candle with that. In desperation, Bella grabbed the pot and turned it over the candle and the dreaded withered hand. Almost immediately, the candle spluttered, then sizzled and sighed. But the hand under the pot flopped so to hold it down took all of Bella's strength. Master, Bob, get up! The robbers are here! Bella shouted. But now there was no need to rouse the men, for almost before she'd opened her mouth, she heard running feet overhead. Then a window slammed, weapons rattled on the floor. Bella wept with relief. She'd broken the spell, but the hand still jumped and rattled under the kettle. You down there! Bella heard George Alderson thunder. Get gone! Get gone at once! Before every man finds a hole in his skull! Warning shots followed, then curses, threats. And in the midst of hammerings and poundings that frightened Bella half to death, there were screams and groans. As the ruckus raged on, she held down the pot, sick with fear, lest the thing pop out. Only heaven knew what more power it had. She would take no chances in allowing it to get free. At the height of the battle, Bella heard the familiar voice shout, We'll leave to the last man if you'll give us the ghostly hand. And that's likely, Bella muttered, pressing down so her arms ached for the hand under the pot gave a sudden wild flop. But the girl grinned when she heard Bob ball. This is what I'll give you. Then followed a blast of bullets and screams of pain. In the ensuing silence, limping footsteps dragged away. Now George Alderson shouted from overhead, Bella! Bella, are you all right? He leapt downstairs with Bob at his heels. Child, where are you? He kept calling. Are you safe? Never better, Master, Bella called back, though she still shook all over. I'm safe, but but please, can Master Bob fetch the parson at once? What in the world? Asked the innkeeper, stopping short at sight of the pale girl holding down the pot on the table. It's the ghostly hand, said Bella, nodding toward the overturned pot. It's still now, but I'd best hold on until the parson comes. With the Aldersons about her, Bella related the terrible events of the night. She told of the dreadful things she held captive of the robber's spell and the burning candle. We'd all be murdered but for you, said Mistress Alderson, embracing the girl. And to show how much he thought of Bella's courage, George Alderson gave her a handsome reward from the store in the cupboard. 
It's your part of the treasure you saved for us, he said warmly. When the parson came and learned what Bella had done, he called her the bravest lass on the moors. Folks hereabouts won't forget your loyalty and courage, he said. After he'd carried away the ghostly hand, he committed the wretched thing to God's care with prayers of remembrance for the man to whom it belonged. And once the parson laid the severed member to rest in holy ground, people say, no one saw the ghostly hand again. To this day, Spidal House stands high on Stainmore. On cold nights in October, winds still tear at the ancient tiles on the roof. Rain rattles the window panes. Yet since Bella routed the highwaymen close to 200 years ago, there's never been a robber bold enough to steal treasure from the cupboard of the old hostelry. The Leg of Gold there was a rich lord who had a proud young wife on whom he lavished beautiful clothes and handsome jewelry. And one day as she came rustling down to dinner in her long satin gown, she caught the heel of her silver shoe in the hem of her skirt, tumbled from top to bottom of the staircase, and broke her leg in seven places. The rich lord sent for the doctor, and the doctor said, Sir, I cannot mend this leg. I must cut it off. And he cut it off. Then the rich lord sent for a goldsmith and bade him make his wife a leg of gold. And the goldsmith made it so beautifully and fitted it on so cunningly that it served the lady just as well as a leg of flesh and blood. And she went walking around in her beautiful clothes and dancing and hopping and skipping about as merrily as she had ever done. So she and her husband lived for seven more years without a care. And then one day, as she came running downstairs, all eager to show her husband how elegant she looked in the costly new gown he had just bought for her, what did she do but catch the high heel of her golden slipper in the hem of her long skirt and tumbled from top to bottom of the stairs again? And this time she broke her neck and died. The Lord had her buried, gold leg and all, in a handsome grave, and put his whole household into expensive mourning. In particular, he dressed up his valet in black satin, and the valet preened himself before the glass and thought, how handsome I am, for he was a very conceited young fellow. And then the valet had another thought. My lady is dead. She has no more use for her gold leg, so why shouldn't I have it? Am I to remain a servant all my days, I with my handsome looks and my fine manners? No, indeed. I will dig up that gold leg, melt it down and sell the gold. Then I shall be possessed of a pretty little fortune and can set up as a gentleman. So that night off he went to the churchyard, dug up the lady, wrenched off the gold leg, reburied the lady, carried the gold leg home, hid it in his wardrobe and got into bed, well pleased with himself. But all that night a voice was calling from the churchyard, Gold, gold, give me my leg of gold. Early the next morning the voice was still calling, and the grave digger heard it. So he hurried to the Lord and said, Sir, your wife will not lie quiet in her grave. She keeps calling and calling. Send someone to find out what she wants. The Lord ran to his wife's grave and said, Dear wife, tell me what you want. And the voice came up from the grave calling out, Gold, gold, give me my leg of gold. Dear wife, said the Lord, your gold leg is buried with you. But the voice called again, gold, gold, give me my leg of gold. Wife, said the Lord, you are not being reasonable. And the voice called again, gold, gold, give me my leg of gold. You have your leg of gold, said the Lord. If you have nothing else to say to me, well then, good day. I will have some prayers said for you. And he went back home.
But an hour later, the gravedigger came again to the Lord. Sir, your wife will not stay quiet. She keeps calling and calling. Send someone to her. So the Lord sent the lady's maid to the grave, and the voice rose out of the grave, calling, Gold, gold, give me my leg of gold. Madam, said the lady's maid, you are wrong to complain. Your golden leg is buried with you. But the voice called again, Gold, gold, give me my leg of gold. Madam, said the lady's maid, is this reasonable? If you have no more to say, I will wish you good morning. Your husband will have some prayers said for you. And she went back to the house. But an hour later, the grave digger came to the Lord again. Sir, your wife will not stay quiet. She is calling louder than ever. Send someone to her, I pray you. And the Lord said to his valet, Go you to the grave and see if you can quiet her. The valet began to tremble. Master, I dare not go. Do as you are told. Go, you coward. Master, I, I, I dare not. Go, go, or I will shoot you. So the valet went, shivering and shaking. And as he went, he heard the voice from the churchyard calling out louder and louder, Gold, gold, give me my leg of gold. So he came to the side of the grave, and his legs bowed under him. Madam, he whimpered, what do you want? It is you that I want, screamed the voice. And the lady came up from the grave, took hold of the valet, dragged him under the ground, and ate him up. <laughs>